What's up guys? One thing that's very important in poker is knowing what it feels like when you're playing your A game. People use the term A game to describe kind of the best that they have in the tank. What it really feels like when you're in that flow state, when the decisions are coming to you very naturally and you just feel like you're really in tune and understanding what's going on. The session I just played for you at 200 Zoom this morning, I was very much in that flow state. I'd had a couple of cups of coffee, I'd woken up nicely. And I was actually just playing my best poker. I was playing close to the optimal level of poker that I believe I'm capable of. So I want to show you what that looks like, what it sounds like as I talk about it, what it feels like, and really encourage you guys to have a think about what are the attributes of your own A game? What's the feeling just before your session? What kind of zone are you in? What kind of frame of mind are you in when you rock up to your session when you're about to play A game? And contrast that to when you're going to play less well. What does it feel like when you're at the tables? What kinds of thoughts are you having? And what kinds of thought processes or mental states are you not having? Then in the next few sessions, actually ask yourself, what kind of level am I playing at right now? And could I do something to improve that? Maybe by setting out and taking a break. Hope you love the content. If you do, please hit the like button and also check out carrotcorner.com for more of our stuff and make sure that you do leave a comment if you have any questions or uncertainties about any of the spots in today's video. Hope you enjoy the footage. Let's get into this 200 zoom session. You join us mid-hand, we open ace-king. Small blind versus big blind here. You can value bet or check here. It's not going to be a big deal. Just going to get some rough mix going on here. We actually had a video that came out really recently called how to play ace-king when you miss the flop. Classic example. So in this case, because ranges are so wide and you're blind versus blind, you're actually going to be doing very well here. So we just flat this ace-7 on the other table. We are two tabling here. You're going to be doing extremely well here on the flop, so well in fact that even after betting 33% of the pot and getting called, you're still going to have a ton of equity. Over here I'm going to play large bets. I don't think a7 is too high up on this board, but I will check more than I'll bet here with ace high. But I think you can bet there. Back over here, I think a really easy check call. Hand is just a bit too good to consider bluff raising with. We do have the ace of spades, which is a nice card in a sense. And if we hit an ace on the river, it can't be a spade, so it can't bring a flush. And this is a very interesting river spot. This is going to be very interesting against the bet. It's not necessarily going to be an automatic fold here. I think we're going to be calling two hands to play at once here. A little bit tricky, but this just looks like a very obvious pure call. And a check back on the river if they check. Over here, we face 14. We do block the nut flush. I don't know how relevant that is for this sizing. Over here, we're going to check back and hopefully win with ace high. We do. The kicker plays. No time here whatsoever. I'm going to call. I think it's an overbluff spot. I'll set out. I'll talk about the left-hand table there, the ace-king, certainly. But first, it's all go here at the start of this crazy session. We have another ace-king to play. So let's do that first before we get to the analysis of the last one. Two tabling zoom, it can be fast and furious. It's definitely plenty of volume. If you're out there wondering how many tables of zoom you should be playing when you're learning the game, getting coached, studying carrot poker school theory or some other course, God forbid, you can study cash injection too. That's a good exploitative course to give you a quick boost to your win rate. You can check all of that out at carrotcorner.com. King 10 here, you can call. I think you can also 4-bet. I'm just going to do some rough mix. It doesn't really matter. We call this time, we flop top 2. Which is nice, I guess. Probably, hopefully. Villain checks back here. I'm only going to be betting very high up in my range in this spot. I think I can definitely use overbet here. Do I want to mix check? I actually don't think so. Exploitatively, I think at the stack depth, they're going to check back a bit too often in position here. So I am actually just going to overbet. I'm not massively worried about the fact that I block two pair here because I think a large part of villain's calling range is jacks, queens, tens, etc. Jamming this river is really interesting. We do block some king x, but I don't think that's the end of the world. We could also just bet big here, we could jam. I think I'll just b75 here with these blockers, I think this is probably right. Not the best result, not the worst result. Let's take a look through some of these. So yeah, this theme of how to play ace-king when you miss the flop, I think it's a really cool question because although it's a beginnery question, it's certainly not like an uninteresting or noob question. It's not like, is your course good enough to beat 10 NL? It's not like that kind of terrible question. It makes no sense. My courses are good enough for whatever stake you're good enough to beat after you take them. They're not, it's not like levels of a computer game, guys. So a good question is actually like, what do we do with Ace-King when we miss a flop? And the answer isn't uniform. It's not like we always check, we always bet, we always turn into a bluff catcher, we always bluff. 
it depends on the relative hand strength of the hand on the board relative to the opponent's range. And in this spot here, the hand is clearly still very high equity. It's quite hard to hit a board of 8-5 deuce for both players, meaning like the biggest overcards that dominate all the other overcards with the ace of spades are going to be the best unpaired hand. And it's going to be a very big equity hand here actually still. So you can certainly value bet this flop. You can also check here. And both plays have a lot of merit. I think starting by just mixing here is correct against the reg. I don't really see a reason to do anything different. On the four of hearts turn, I believe that we could continue to block for value, like very thin value, or we could also check. I didn't have a great deal of time, as you saw in the hand here, for us to know what to do here, but check just seems completely fine and natural. Am I playing block in this spot? That's the question. Do I want to build in to my toolkit? I think I do here, and the reason I do is I just have a lot of hands like sixes, five, six, sevens, weak eight X. I can just see a ton of merit on a turn that does uncap villain to some extent. Like I have a lot of thinner value bets and out of position. The thing is that checking is not really that great. We talk about this a lot in the grade two of the carrot poker school where we really get into the weeds of the out of position game. There are three grades, by the way. We discuss this idea of being out of position and check not being a great option because you're not closing the action by checking when you're out of position. If only when you're in position, one of the reasons that you play bigger bets or check strategies is that you don't want to reopen the action without much gain. But when you're out of position, the action's already open. So checking and betting are usually quite close together with a thin value bet. Not always the case in position. So we decide to check here, although we could play block bets in this out of position spot, as we just talked about. When we face this, we have an extremely strong bluff capture. We have the ace of spades, which is nice because if villain has a hand like 10, nine of spades, then they have less outs and they have less implied odds against our specific combo because we cannot hit an ace on the river that also brings a flush. It's impossible because the only card that would do that is the ace of spades and that bad boy is located firmly within our hole cards. So it cannot pop up on the river unless you're dealing with some kind of cheating scandal. Imagine the Ace of Spades came on the river here and it was like Carrot Man versus Poker Stars 2023, the lawsuit. That could happen, but it didn't because the river was one of the legal rivers, which was the Six of Spades. So we call with this very dominating bluff catcher. Six of Spades comes on the river. We check again. Villain goes for this. So what are they really saying here? Well, they're saying that they have a hand that's good, could be nutted, but might not be. They're kind of saying they have like for value a three, which is possible they could have like king three queen three something like that there aren't a great deal of those combos and i don't think they always call flop either unless they're clubs or spades i think they could have a seven for sure as well a seven is a very likely hand here villain could bet turn with king seven queen seven loads of hands like that and this is a nice sizing and it does kind of catch all it allows them to bet a lot of those hands for value they could also have a flush of varying varieties. So the value range is actually very big in this spot. There's quite a lot of combos that the value range spans here. But the good news is that we do only need to win about 30% of the time to call a three quarters pot size bet. That's the closest milestone to this. It's a little bit less than three quarters, but yeah, about 30% about required pot share for us. The reason I decided that this spot was probably over bluffed was I think that a lot of the flushes are just going to go bigger here. Oftentimes they're going to over bet or something like that. I'm not sure it's very easy for villain to control their frequencies here with a hand like 10-9, Jack-10, Queen-Jack, Queen-10, the list goes on, all of these offsuit cards, as well as some big card, some other big card stuff, possibly like the King-9 and things like that. I think it's kind of easy to lose control of the bluff frequency here if villain isn't careful. I don't think I block that many bluffs with the King of Diamonds, although I'll block some. I think most of the bluffs here are in the 10-9, Jack-10, Queen-Jack sort of vicinity. And I don't have a Spade or a Club, which is going to unblock the Queen-Jack, Jack-10 combos that are most likely to call flop. Though I think actually Blind versus Blind in this flop, like all Jack-10 and all 10-9 is probably just a call, to be honest. Like, I don't think that's something villains should be making a habit out of folding on the flop to one-third pot. I do think that's an overfolded spot, though, at, like, some of the stakes that you guys play, you probably do overfold that flop as big blind just because i i've coached many of you guys i've coached hundreds of you you can't hide from me i know where your leaks are i know i'm watching you i know your leaks remember that if you ever come across me at the table just fold aces pre because i know your leaks so yeah i think it's a bit easier to lose control of a bluff frequency here after taking this line in such a wide range spot than it is to under bluff so i think the spot's more likely over bluffed than under bluffed effectively okay there was another cool hand that happened too let's take a look at that one so I guess the main question that exists over this hand is, well, why did I go ahead and overbet this turn? And the idea is that when Villain checks back deep here, I really expect there to be a lot of kind of capness going on. I don't think people are going to slow play the, the, the requisite slow plays here. I think they're going to very often have jacks, etc. 
aces just trying to like we're a little bit deep here not massively but it's going to be a factor so i think people's ranges are very capped here for that reason i think the top of my value range like king 10 on blocking both flush draws and blocking loads of pair plus draw like sevens eights jacks queens villain just has such a merge range here that we just want to max out our value bets here and construct the value betting range around the top of our range here we don't need to be value betting much thinner than like king queen or something if that so totally fine then on the river the reason i sized down a bit here was that well i figured while my range still has massive equity if i go all in here yes i can run into like the like the random hand that beats me sometimes like that slow played flop i think it's unlikely that i don't have the best hand here but it's not impossible so i don't have like a 90 percent equity hand probably like high 80s or something and i am blocking some hands like 10 9 or king queen ace queen that would like to ace king sorry that would like to bluff catch here at some frequency so i figured i'd go smaller i think there is an argument for jamming as well i just think that when i start jamming i expect too many real life villains to be concentrated around jacks queens sevens eights stuff like that ace 10 jack 10 etc queen 10 and i just feel like that region is going to overfold a lot versus a jam it may overfold versus the sizing too but i felt like there was a bigger spike in fold equity there proportionately to the sizing if i jammed in other words i thought that pool was probably overly elastic against the jam that means they're contracting the range too much against that so opted for the smaller sizing okay let's get back into the pool here fours i'm just gonna mix a bit of fold with it's not gonna be a pure open a7 in the hijack is gonna be a pure open empty seat here right so what i call it hijack 887 with pocket fours on the left hand table this is a spot where my range wants to usually check i think i could build a little bit of bet but i don't mind actually simplifying to like a range check strategy here i think it's totally reasonable and king jack eight over here just gonna deem this a range bet board bet quickly get on with life not much to say over here in the five turn i think you can play big better check usually do i want to build block in this spot i don't think so i think i'll just play big better check and i will check for us back over here this isn't like a totally unreasonable barrel the eight is obviously not great for range we do have a tad of showdown value and we do block some back doors that call flop the full turn so i will check and over here a pretty easy showdown i don't see any reason to try to get value there i think people do check a bit too much 10x on that river instead of just going for value perhaps underestimating the condensedness of my range and not really understanding what that means here i think we could ostensibly chop against something like ace 10 or something like that the board is going to run 8 8 ace king jack against that and we will chop and obviously that's it's also quite an underfolded spot from a reg in my opinion overall like if we do go for a bet check bet bluff there i think it gets through a little bit less often than it's supposed to like a reg is going to do a stellar job of bluffing all of the absolutely mandatory bluffs we say in carrot poker school river blunder theorem is the theory that when you get to the river with a range that's stronger than that of your opponent and you have the bottom part of that that you should bluff and you'll be profitable bluffing there in theory not all bluffs are break even on the river in theory just ones that happen in neutral to unfavorable worlds for your range I roll up third here, um, three bet, and the rest call with ace five. This certain ace six here, I would roll a lot more three bet with. Once like ace two, ace three, they just do way worse calling. Going to play small bets on nine five four, which means I can actually bet this hand if I want. Some boards I play big bets on, some I play small bets on. This is one I tend to play small bets on, so I bet this about fifty percent of the time. I, I don't really mind what I do. It's not a huge deal. I think people are far too concerned these days with protection as a concept. I think with a five here again, we should be in mixed territory. I don't know the player, so I'm a little suspicious that they could be somebody who's playing a bit too passively. And if that's the case, I think bet outperforms check here. We just get the denial right away. We can't value bet river here. Slight hesitation there on river, which is interesting. But just going for like a turn value bet and river check back there seems good. I would make that play every time I believe my opponent's potentially weaker because it just makes it that bit more likely that their range is capped. And if their range is capped, I have a much higher equity hand in practice than I do in theory. And this is really the skill we're looking to build is being able to differentiate between theory and practice and spot the difference really between the two universes. Ace 9 here, I don't think we can call, I do think we can mix a little bit of 4 bet, so let's go 33% with it and we'll fold the rest of the time. It's not a bad idea to just pure fold that hand if you just want to focus on playing aces here. King Queen 3 mono, I think we play a lot of bets, but probably not pure. Let's go for like 60% bet and we'll use a small sizing, gonna check this time. And makes a pretty nice check, doesn't have a lot of nut potential, very mediocre. Again, this player, we're kind of suspecting they're recreational so far, just from how they're playing. I could be very wrong about that, but I'm going to go ahead and use the... Am I going to block or am I going to big bet? I think I'm just going to big bet here. I could also check again. It's totally fine. 
but I just have a feeling they may be underprotecting that checking range. King, 10 here on 5 for a deuce. I think this one could ostensibly just be a pure check. I'm going to check it. I want to check very often here. Maybe 75, 80% range check here. And this hand seems like probably not one that ever gets into the bet category. Something like Jack 10 or whatever that gains more useful fold equity could. Just going to full turn. Probe is a little bit overdone, but that's not a hand we can really do anything with there. That's why I prefer C betting small on some of these boards with my real air region when I'm against an unknown weaker player, because they can overstab turn, and you don't really want to invite that when you have the bottom of your range if C betting is a viable alternative. So if you like the way we do things at Carrot Corner, don't forget to check out our paid content, our structured syllabuses. When I say we, I really mean me. I'm kind of like the one-man machine at Carrot Corner. I do have lovely people that work for me and do a stellar job editing videos and things like that, but the courses are all, all by me so far. We may be bringing some other coaches into the mix at some point, but you can find the Carrot Poker School, the very big marathon course that I made on Poker Theory, as well as Cash Injection, a, a quick way to really boost your win rate at the tables by exploiting pool. You can get all of that at carrotcorner.com. Also, we have solved ranges on there too. So a very quick spot to go over here. This wasn't too exciting, but I do think the turn is, is relevant. I didn't manage to capture this one. I had the wrong table up. So we've edited it out. I'm just going to go over it in the replayer instead. So Jack 10-3. Going to be going ahead and using large bets here. I think Queens is ostensibly just a pure value bet. I don't think we'd be checking back ever here with this hand. So going for bet this time, B75 texture. I won't talk about that too much. This is all in my course. This is all standard theory. King turn, I think you can bet or check. I think Queens is definitely one of these hands that's super high EV still. I don't think it'll be a pure bet. I think I can check here. But I think a lot of people like pure check here and just treat the hand as too mediocre now. I think it's still a lot better than you would think. The open ender does go towards the value component of this hand. And there's some implied odds on an ace or nine river, albeit it'll be four straight and not a ton. Ace queen is obviously heavily blocked by our hand, which is good. And there's a lot of pair plus straight draw type hands here, pair plus flush draw hands continuing again in villain's range here. Notably though, this king is decreasing our equity and no longer is our hand a mandatory value bet like it would be on a three or a five or something like that that's not a diamond. Okay, so the river is a five, villain checks, we go for b75. I think this is a very normal sizing. Our bluffs here will come from like a6 suited that didn't bet turn. It will usually bet turn, but it might not. And then things like fours or sixes may be able to be turned into a bluff on this note as well. Queen's pretty comfortable value bet, value betting down to about ace jack here or something like that for the sizing. And if I think my opponent's super capped, what is it with these screen names, by the way, guys? Like, who is it that thinks that this is a good screen name. I mean, what kind of mentality do you have to have to think this is a good screen name? No matter how you interpret the screen name, it's pretty bad either way. Anyway, let's continue. So we go for the B75 here, villain folds, and yeah, let's get back into the action. Against cutoff, I can play a little bit of flat. I think this hand is just going to 3-bit though. I could be wrong. Against 2.2, well, I just, I'm just going to start making this 9 against 2.2. I think it's better. Just because my range is a little bit linear, it's got quite a lot of mergy hands in there that are thin value denial raises, so you don't want to make it massive like you do in the big blind here. 9-8, I actually don't care whether I open or not, I can mix this and hijack, it's super break even. Our friend here comes along again, confirming their identity as a recreational player for now, provisional identity assigned. I'm going to just fold to the squeeze with 9-8, it's a sort of holding that does very badly on certain boards where it makes a straight i'll leave you to solve that riddle and figure out why tell me in the comments why 98 is a particularly horrible suited connector let me know especially in a squeeze pot why is that bonus points for anyone that can tell me the answer okay pocket six is just going to be mostly call here you can do a little bit of raise actually you can definitely build some donk bets on four three dos let's do that let's say range can donk about 40 percent hand about 55 60 something like that gonna check this time but Unknown to villain, we are building donk bets there. Going to be playing B75 on this turn, so obviously just checking six is pure. And over here, we're going to go ahead and just call the 4-3 in the big blind, check the flop, see what develops. Check the river here, still with a little bit of showdown against the wide button range. Very interesting that they don't consider value betting base on the river there. I mean, maybe that's theoretically correct against someone that's slow playing enough rivers. I would think against pool and maybe even against me that that might not be the case. So open aces here. Pick up a call from the big blind, king 75 going to be a small bet board. I believe aces is going to be pure on this board. There's some hands you can check here that don't look like checks. They're more like king 10, king jack, king queen. Aces unblocking the king being a little bit too strong is just going to be a c bet. If we get raised, we'll call. I'm not going to build any 3 bets against this in position on king 7 5. I think it's really unnecessary. There are spots I build 3 bets on the flop, but they're not this one. I'm just going to call in like a couple of seconds here, just taking my time, balancing my timing. 
going to call really horrific turn for range in a sense because 9-8 gets there, 4-3 gets there, a 6 hits the pair and may stop bluffing although they may keep sort of denial bluffing here, it's possible. And the other bluffs that villain can have are things like 10-9 backdoor, ace-4 backdoor. This turn connects with villain's range extremely hard. I don't actually hate folding turn here to a very big bet, especially pot, and the reason I'm actually going to fold here is that I now have a bluff catcher and not a very good one, because I also block stuff like ace-8 of hearts and clubs that might raise flop and bluff turn, so if anything I block bluffs here, I block no value whatsoever. I have a bluff catcher for sure, meaning I don't beat any value bets, and I think Pot could easily be a weaker player, and a weaker player is really under bluffing this node. A reg might be under bluffing this node, but a weaker player is really under bluffing that node, so I love the turn fold there, very, very big fan. This is a hand a lot of you are going to get wrong. I actually think this is a mandatory turn lead in practice, and the reason I think that is that when Villain opens hijack here and we call in the big blind, we end up in this sort of spot where our hand is very trashy. Like our showdown value here is actually nothing because if we check River, Villain is going to bet and our EV will be reduced to zero because they'll have value bets, they'll have bluffs and we won't be able to call profitably. We'll maybe be able to call if we want, but it's not going to be doing very well. Be close to break even basically. Therefore, we can deem our hand effectively worthless on a check check node unless we hit the river. And therefore, I think turning it into a bluff when we have trips outs, two pair outs, and also straight outs is very warranted. I think the fold equity we get here with this hand is super useful because if villain has a gutter like King 10, they're folding so many outs. I think this is a mandatory bet when you put all of this together. You just have to go ahead and lead for denial bluff attributes here. Like you can picture so, so many hands better than this hand that are folding to like sevens, no diamond, eights, no diamond, tens, no diamond, nines, no diamond. Even with like queens, no diamond villains in a bit of an annoying spot here. Not that they'll fold that often, but it can happen. So very profitable lead here for B75 and yeah, never taking any other play. A couple of hands that may develop into something here. Got king, queen on one table, jack 10 on the other. The jack 10 we get three bit by small blind. I think this is a pure continue. It's a little... Sizing is kind of standard. If this was like 12 or something, I could probably start to mix fold. I think this is just going to be a call though. A we'll flush drawn to overs over here with King Queen. And we're going to set out next hand. This is very sensible. We're obviously folding to this three bet, but we don't want to play two hands at the same time. We're just decreasing our EV. Let's focus fully on this interesting pot that's brewing here. So this is the sort of hand against C-bet that will always be a call. Against check, we can definitely bet. I think going for about the same global frequency with this hand as we do with range, like going for the same frequency with this hand as we do globally is fine. I'm going to use small bets here about half the time. When I don't have a strong feeling about whether to bet or whether to check, I just, I just roll it. I roll it about 50-50. I really don't care here whether I check or whether I bet. A competent player is going to be check raising, applying enough pressure there that I'm not like better off betting than I am checking, or at least that's not obvious to me. They check again, I think a mandatory value bet now. I think B75 is the, or do I just use small bets actually? I think I use small bets in this spot. The range I'm betting here is not very flush heavy at all. After I check back flop, yeah, I think I just go small here actually. And I'm meant to make up for this in theory by getting raised a lot. So I do get check raised here at a decent frequency. If film does check call and we get a brick river, I can always go ahead and, or non-diamond river I should say, I can always go ahead and overbet at that point. But for now, I'm just gonna use this sizing. If they raise, it gets super interesting, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm capable of having that hand there. That's an important thing. A lot of people aren't. It's the way that our range should want to play the spot. So there's actually no reason to big bet that spot. We should get raised a lot by some value hands that we beat and some bluffs that we beat as well, semi bluffs that we beat. So we don't need to rely as heavily on pot building when we're meant to get raised at fair frequency. I know that may look counterintuitive to some to bet that size on the turn, but it is theoretically justified and I'm not gonna deviate against that. A kind of unknown regular looking player. I love it when they don't lead this board. This board is the, this is the worst flop possible, I believe, of all the flops in the game tree. Maybe four or five, six is worse, but no, I think seven, six, five is at least the second worst possible flop in this situation. So I am actually just going to go ahead and check back range and go from there. I wonder if this could be one of my bluff raises if Phelan leads here. It doesn't block spades, so possibly not. I'm just wondering against two bigs whether this is very close actually this is very close i don't want to overfold this spot i have hands like ace deuce that like clearly fold here but then i have a lot of better hands too i think i can fold this one because so many of my hands are straight draws and better here and i don't have a spade if i had a spade though i'd mix call and raise on this node with no spade i think i can fold that's my best guess sometimes in game you just got to do your best guess at solving a spot if you like these live play formats do smash the like button by the way guys let us know that you like this format
It's one I really enjoy making, so I'm super happy to make loads more of these. I just enjoy sitting here with my coffee playing poker. Sometimes being able to play poker in the life of a coach is really refreshing and fun. Jack-9 not going to be able to call three-way here, even though these are two weaker players. I think this is a bit too light. It's just a too much of a dominated hand that really struggles to win big pots, even when it connects quite hard. So not really interested. Pocket Snowmans. We do like the Snowmans. We're a fan of the Snowmans on this channel. We're going to go ahead and open them for the purposes of True EV. True EV for Snowmen. Going to play a few more spots here, guys, and then we're going to be wrapping up for today. Hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have any questions about any of the hands as well, you know, you can let us know. A couple of hands going on here. You can let us know in the comments, and we'll get back to you. We're going to cold 4-bet here with the Ace-King, I think, going up to... Let me see here. Probably, like, 20.8 is sufficient. I don't think you need to go particularly large in the spot. And I'm going to set out next hand here, just in case this other one develops into something. I almost timed out the Ace-King suited, that would have been a mistake. An embarrassing one at that. And what I'm really trying to do when I'm playing a session of 200 zoom is ignore the results entirely. This is such a high variance game with such minimal win rate against like the regs in the pool. The regs are pretty solid, so I think my win rate in this game is not going to be massive. Although it will depend on how many weaker players are in the pool. If there are, you know, 33% or 40% of the pool of weaker players, I'm going to have a big win rate. If it's only 20% of the pool, I'll have a smaller one. So the number of blue tags that are kicking around here is really important for win rate. But given that win rate is quite low and variance is quite high, it's very important to just have a long-term ethos about a game like this if you're going to play it. That means that over 50k hands or even 100k hands, you might be miles away from your true win rate. It's a very high standard deviation game and you have to bear that in mind. Gonna roll a bit of 3-bet here in this spot. Oops, you don't have up to 42 though, right? That would be a little bit overkill, so let's go. Let's go to 12. Got him. All the 3-bets are working today. That's a sign of you running good. When your 3-bets are getting through, you know you're running good, right? You get 4-bet every single time you 3-bet bluff. That's when you know you're running bad. There's so many subtle ways that you can run good and bad. And you can run good and bad over like a very large sample as well. I want one more really eventful fun spot for you guys. And then we are going to wrap this one up for today. Don't forget to check out carrotcorner.com for all of our paid content, our courses, all of that. And of course, why not subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can continue to browse through all of our free content on YouTube. King A, I'm going to always open, and that's because we have a, a weaker player, one of the aforementioned people that boosts our win rate in this pool. Ace-9 is going to be pure as well. So knowing when to open pre is a little bit of an art. Yes, you don't gain massive bits of EV from making those choices, but if you get those correct over and over again, it's going to make a big difference to your bottom line back to Ace King. I would definitely say I'm playing my A game today and I think that's what I'm going to brand this video as. I think it's really important to know what your own A game feels like because if you can figure that out then you're going to be in a much better spot in terms of having the chance to replicate that. So if you know what kinds of thought processes, what kinds of moods pre-game warm-ups lead to your A game and you can kind of detect that pattern, that's going to be really important for your EV long term trying to replicate that, that A game. Kind of weird spot here, we check King 4 in the blind. I think you could lead here. I'm just going to check though and see what this limper wants to do. Just give them the chance to do stuff. Going to bet one big blind here. A little bit of denial, I think it's fine. I'd rather not bluff catch a passive player on a 4 straight board. So if you can value bet and denial bet, you usually don't want to bluff catch. That's usually how it goes. And they fold. Useful fold equity, of course, when you have a baby pair like a 4. All fold equity is your friend. And we have the jacks here to round up today's session, but nothing happens. I am setting out next big blind now, so that's going to be it for today's video. I've got to go to the gym, guys. Otherwise, I'd record for longer. You like my brag? You like my brag that I'm actually going to go to the gym today? I liked it. All right, so if you like this stuff, you know what to do. Just hit the like button if you like this content, and do check out carrotcorner.com for loads more stuff. We'll be back very soon with all of the educational poker things that you need to improve your game and your win rate and move through the stakes. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.